The perfect world everyone's wishing for is actually coming. The environment is going to be amazing. Pure air, fresh, sparkling, clean water, plenty of organic food with no chemicals, no pesticides, no poison. The soil will be so fertile and pure that everything grows beautifully and fragrantly lush. The society, that's also amazing. Jesus Christ himself will be king. Everyone knows that. He rules with a rod of iron. No wars, no terrorists, no anarchy or riots, no crime, no rebellion. Just peace, prosperity, and universal justice. There are no homeless, no refugees, no poverty, and there's no prejudice. And by the way, all the leaders are glorified, perfected saints who exhibit perfect patience, love, compassion, and fidelity. With the healthcare system, that's also amazingly non existent. Because in this coming world, there are no diseases, there are no malformed bodies, no blindness, no deafness, no birth defects. In fact, everyone is healthy and seems to live indefinitely. This is almost heaven. As you imagine, the most peaceful, pure, prosperous, healthy, and beautiful world of flourishing people, flourishing plants and animals and weather and life. That's the kingdom. That's the thousand-year reign of Jesus Christ. That's the millennium promised to Israel, written about in almost a third of the Bible, and told it's coming by Jesus, and it's sent by God. The thousand-year kingdom is what Isaiah describes all the way through his 66 chapters. And that's what John describes in the book of Revelation, using words and ideas from almost 800 other passages, touching almost every book of the Bible. That's when Jesus returns to earth. He restores and he rules. This is our 14th class going through the book of Isaiah. We've been exploring Isaiah. As I remind you, it takes three hours and 45 minutes to read the whole book. And we've only had soon to be 15, 50 minute segments. So we're exploring, not covering every word. But in our 14th class, when Jesus Christ returns to earth, remember as the king over all the earth has promised, he restores the earth almost back to the perfections of Eden. There is still sin, but Satan is banished. So the only sin is that which is in the hearts of the humans. And therefore, as long as Jesus rules with this rod of iron that Psalm 2 talks about, the earth seems almost like heaven. And Jesus is described in Isaiah 2, 4. And if you want to open there with me in your Bible, We'll read what's going on in the world because it helps connect everything. Many people don't understand how we can have such a tragic ending to the Bible of the great white throne and this huge multitude throne in the lake of fire when Jesus is actually on the earth now ruling. And this explains it. Starting in chapter 2 and verse 4, it says this, And he shall judge between the nations and rebuke many peoples. They shall beat their swords into plowshares, their spears into pruning hooks, and shall not lift up the sword against nations, neither shall they learn war any more. And it goes on and on to describe all the wonders in chapter 2 of what's coming. Where does this fit? How does Isaiah fit with the rest of the Bible? Well, looking down at your slides, we're talking about when Jesus returns to earth, when he restores, when he rules. This, as you know, is only one of 15 classes. We're right down there at the uh, 14th hour, as you can see. But this is also the final line in our outline we've been looking at. God's expectations of his people, his future plans. Uh, we've looked at the first 39 chapters of chastening. Now we're in that final section, 27 chapters of our merciful God comforting his people. At the bottom, you see God describes the millennium. That is what we're looking at today. Continuing, we're in that seventh passage that's so important, uh, the second coming through the millennium, Isaiah 63, 65, 66, which uh, ties into our 
key chapters of the book. The book of Isaiah, as you know, and as we've pointed out all the way through this class, has three big themes, major themes. Number one, conviction. Uh, that comes to us in chapter 6. And what we're talking about is this overwhelming sense of sin and wrath of God against sin. And it's very clear in the 21 times that the book of Isaiah uses the term woe. In God's sight, it's woeful. Our good deeds are, as Isaiah 64 says in our passage today, like filthy rags. So God wants us convicted of our sin, and only those who are convicted of their sin can come to him and embrace salvation. Uh, next, a big theme and a major theme of Isaiah is the confession, the all-pervading awareness of the power, the majesty, the holiness of God. And 23 times in this book, God uses his name, the Holy One of God. It's almost unique to Isaiah. And outside of Isaiah, we find it in the New Testament when uh, fallen angels confront Christ. They go, oh, you're the Holy One of God. But now look where we are. In this lesson, we're talking about confidence, the crystal clear sight of the salvation and coming victory of Christ. In the next slide, we're going to use this chart to kind of fit together all the pieces from the Old Testament and the New Testament and explain the millennium. If you look up for just a second, you notice that in our lesson, Isaiah 2.4 talks about the Lord uh, reigning and, and being over all the earth. I've also put this reference here. Revelation 19 and 20. Now, how do we get from uh, the, the fall of Judah, the destruction, the church age, the day of the Lord? Isaiah is right here prophesying, and he's prophesying this event is on the horizon, the fall of the southern kingdom to the Babylonians. As he talks about that, he keeps kind of catapulting to this day of the Lord, restoration of Israel, the return of the Messiah, and all of the, the wonders of the day of the Lord. Not only having uh, right here the tribulation starting, uh, right here having the second coming of Christ, right here having the millennium, and then having the final eternal state. So the day of the Lord has pieces to it, which... Isaiah just seems to switch between all the channels and actually kind of catapult right over the church because he, as Paul said in the New Testament, the church was a mystery. It wasn't known by those Old Testament prophets. So the chronology of all this comes in the book of Revelation. So Revelation Chapter 1, chapters 2 and 3, chapters 4 and 5, chapters 6 through 18, chapter 19, chapter 20, 21 and 22. The book of Revelation is a timeline from the, the time of the Apostle John from A.D. 90, as he's on Patmos, all the way, it's a timeline, all the way until eternity in heaven. And it's in consecutive unfolding, beautiful sequential order. Now watch. Jesus comes down to John on Patmos and tells him the purpose of the book of Revelation. Chapter 1, verse 1 says, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave his servants. So the whole purpose of Revelation is so that written down, we, the sons and daughters of God through the work of Jesus Christ, the members of the body of Christ, the church, would know from right here on earth, right after the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, right after the birth of the church, we would know everything God has planned to the end. That's the purpose. And what it's supposed to do is, verse 3 of Revelation chapter 1 says it's supposed to bless us. Uh, 1 John 3 says that it's supposed to help us to be pure because we know he's coming and so we want to be pure. Paul said in 1 Thessalonians, it's supposed to encourage us, it's supposed to comfort us. It's also supposed to help us to want to, as 1 Corinthians tells us, take people with us to heaven. So that's what chapter 1 is, the purpose. Chapter 2 and 3 of Revelation shows us the church on earth. 
it's, it's a very, very powerful explanation of what God wants us doing right now and the examination. Then all of a sudden we go in chapter 4 and 5 with the church in heaven around the throne. And so it's Jesus on the island, the church on the earth, and all of a sudden the church is around the throne in heaven. Then we go into the tribulation. Chapter 6 of Revelation to 18 is all about the unfolding wrath of God that lasts for seven years. It has a dividing, a midpoint that, that Daniel talks about and is described. Then we have the second coming of Christ, thousand year reign in heaven. Isaiah, he keeps sending incredible prophecies about all these parts, but they're not in any order. As we'll see, as I uh, go through all the chapters of Isaiah that, that talk about, especially this, the thousand years. That's called the millennium. And uh, this thousand year rule of Christ, the millennial temple, which Isaiah talks about, just hit and miss, but Ezekiel spends eight full chapters plus an introduction though from 40 to 48 is all about this millennial temple that we'll talk about so back to your your slides let me go through what i just showed you on the board and show you what we're going to see in isaiah for one thing isaiah is going to talk about the seven-year tribulation as far as that it's a time of wrath of god against sin and of refining Israel. And Israel, we're going to actually go through Zechariah 12 through 14, gets decimated during the tribulation. In fact, two-thirds of all the Jewish people alive are exterminated during the tribulation. It's a horrific time. It's like a second uh, holocaust. Uh, Jesus actually returns, and we'll see that most clearly, in Zechariah 12 through 14, to rescue the Jews, see right here, they're attacked by the Antichrist. As soon as that, as Jesus returns, see the tribulation ends, but look what happens here. There's a sheep and goat judgment. Jesus describes that in Matthew 25. What is that? Well, look up for just a second. Did you know that Jesus explains that at the second coming of Christ, no unbeliever, no rebel is allowed. There's kind of like a wall right here. And no unbeliever survives the tribulation to go into the kingdom. They are going to be, at, at the second coming of Christ, Jesus said the angels are going to go through and sort out the believers from the unbelievers. So they're going to be Many believers that survive the tribulation. Many believers that survive all those plagues, especially Jews that, that are protected, as we read about in chapter 12 of Revelation. God actually protects this huge group of them, and Satan can't get to them, and he takes them into the wilderness. But only believers, believing Jews and Gentiles, so, so these believers that survive the tribulation both Jews and Gentiles go into this 1,000-year rule of Christ, the millennium. So the millennium starts only with believers. Now, before we get done today, I'm going to emphasize that, so I want you to think about the implications. Okay, back to your chart. That's what's called the sheep those are the believers, and goat judgment. The Lord separates, uh, he ends the earthly life of the goats. They go to wait uh, for judgment. Now look up again, that's over here. Uh, and I brought back the chart from a few classes ago. Um, everybody on earth, when they, they end their earthly existence, they, up until the cross, up until the time of Christ, when people died, they all went to the same place, either paradise, that's for the believers, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Noah, Enoch, you know what I mean, David, uh, all of the Old Testament saints, or 
the lost went to the other side of Hades or the grave or uh, Sheol. So uh, this is called the grave sometimes, Sheol other times, Hades, that's uh, a Greek word. And so all people were on one side, this is the happy side, and this is the sad side. Uh, this is a place of torment and fire. This is a place of bliss. But all of them went there. But after the cross, the believers were taken by Christ to be in heaven, in paradise. But still, all normal people, when they die, they go here. Now, I hate, hate to say this, but if you know any unbelievers, when they died, the instant that they left the hospital, the instant they left the car accident, their spirit immediately was experienced conscious, complete torment. Now, it's not hell. Notice where hell is. This is the lake of fire. Right now, that is totally empty. The first person to go there will be the, the person masquerading as Jesus Christ, who is the Antichrist. Uh, the Antichrist and his false prophet. Those two will be the first two into the lake of fire. The third will be Satan himself. Isn't that interesting? Uh, the lake of fire was prepared for Satan and his angels, and those who are dwelt by him and Satan himself will be the first ones in there. But we have this place right here, which we'll come up to, which is called the pit, because Satan will be in there too. Back to our chart. We have the resurrected bodies of Old Testament tribulation believers, and they are going to be reigning with Christ. And if you look up here, during the millennium, all those who have resurrected bodies will be serving. And we're going to see this uh, explained in Isaiah. They will be running the, as far as the, the uh, society, the judges, the, the ones who are representing Jesus Christ, the government will be all of us. And then at the end, right here, of the millennium, Remember I told you that everyone that entered the millennium was a believer? Well, at the end of the millennium, there are going to be an awful lot of children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren of believers who do not follow the Lord, and we're going to see that in Revelation. And then, of course, Isaiah talks about much about the new heaven and the new earth, so we'll get to that. So, let's go to the next slide, and that is Isaiah explains for us, look at this, the coming 1,000 year rule of Christ on earth. And the way he does that is, and we're going to go through each of these verses. So um, you, you um, see this passage right here? Turn there with me. And I'm going to read it and I'm going to explain it to you. So Isaiah 24, 21. Satan is overcome by Christ and is imprisoned. Now look at 24, 21. It says, uh, it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord will punish on high the host of the exalted ones and on the earth the kings of the earth and they will be gathered together as prisoners gathered in the pit and they will be shut up in the prison after many days they will be punished and on and on you can read. Now look up for a second. What's going on here? Well, Revelation chapter 20 tells us that at the end of the tribulation, at the end of the tribulation, at the second coming of Christ, that Satan is bound and put here into the pit. And so the first thing, look back at your sides, that happens is that there is Satan overcome by Christ, part of the second coming, he's in prison, and look at what happens. Jesus begins to rule over all the earth. Isaiah 2, 4 says he judges between the nations, he rebukes the people, and uh, they beat their swords into plowshares. In fact, he transforms the whole earth. Then, number three, we go to Isaiah 35. So turn to Isaiah 35, and we'll read this. And you can look up from your slides, I'll turn there with you, starting in verse 8. Isaiah 35, because this is beautiful. 
a highway shall be there. Now, wait a minute. Look, look what I told you. Isaiah is going between talking about, just before this, he's talking about the coming Babylonians, the, the uh, Babylonians taking the Assyrians, the doom of Edom, all these things are, and all of a sudden, brrr, he sends a, this prophetic preview of what's going to go in the day of the Lord. So let me read you. I love this. A highway shall be there. This is in the millennial kingdom. And a road. And it will be called the highway of holiness. It, it, in other words, it's the road to God. Now, now watch. I'll, I'll do it here on this uh, drawing up here. This is, here's the earth. And uh, right here where Christ is crucified, uh, is Jerusalem, and on the same place in Jerusalem where Jesus uh, lived and served and, and died, it's going to become the center of the earth. I mean, all activity is going to be centered, as we'll see in a minute, around Jerusalem, and especially this temple, because Jesus is going to be sitting here on a throne ruling in Jerusalem, on the earth, physically, visibly, Jesus is going to be in the center of this millennial temple. And the temple itself, I mean, it's the fourth temple. Solomon's temple was the first temple. Herod's temple was the second. There's one during the tribulation that John sees and Jesus sees and Paul sees and Daniel sees. And it's in the tribulation. But there's going to be one in Ezekiel 40 to 48 that God builds. And that temple is right there, and it's the size. It's actually measured in Ezekiel. It's the size of a city block sitting inside of, look at this, a, a kind of huge, what I call visitor center, that's 25,000 cubits long and 25,000 cubits wide. Now, we don't use cubits very much. That's 18 inches. It's the distance from here to here on a person from their elbow to their hand. That 18 inches, foot and a half, 25,000 of them is 37,000 feet, which is about seven miles. So this visitor center is approximately a 50 square mile area that has roads coming to it from all over the world. Look back at verse eight. And a highway shall be there called the highway of holiness. And so people that want to obey the Lord, they can come on this highway and visit the temple. Now, already we're getting kind of into stuff that most people, see, most people don't really read Ezekiel. Most people don't read Isaiah that often. You understand what I mean? And many people stay away from Revelation. It's just too confusing. So, this highway is there, the way to God, and the unclean shall not pass over it. This is a little reminder that no one comes in that's pagan, lost, unbelieving, only believers. And there are going to be many people that don't want to come there. And what we'll see in Zechariah is that God does something to them. If they overtly rebel, he kills them. Now that's ruling with a rod of iron. If they just won't come to visit him, you know what it says in the Bible, in Zechariah 14, 17, and 18, it says, if they won't come at the feast times, especially the Feast of Tabernacles are reinstituted, God says, it won't rain on your garden, on your farm, no rain. So everybody around you is going to have rain, you won't, because you are not coming to see me. See, God is very direct in his desire that everybody know Christ. Back to your slides, only believing Jews and Gentiles will come in. Uh, this is, uh, whoop, I'll go back for just a second. That slide right there, let me back up, is just the drawing. You see the abyss I had, uh, and there's the lake of fire, and there's heaven, and there's the grave. I just wanted you to have that in your notes. Uh, number four, God establishes universal peace. And what the scriptures say, I'll just read these verses to you. Uh, there's so many. The mountains shall depart, the hills shall be removed, but my kindness shall not depart, nor shall my covenant of peace. So 
there will be universal peace during the uh, millennium, and Christ restrains all violence. Now, do you remember this Christmas verse? Let me read that. Christ restrains all violence. Isaiah 9, 7. Do you remember 9, 6? His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God. Look what verse 7 says. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. So there is no violence. It's all restraint. And Jesus, it says in Isaiah eleven fifteen, rules in righteousness. Number seven, this is the seventh um, uh, explanation and description of the millennium from Isaiah. It says in Isaiah 4.2 that there will be this, this complete prosperity and abundance of food. Let me read it to you. In that day the branch of the Lord shall be beautiful and glorious, and the fruit of the earth shall be excellent and appealing uh, for those of Israel who have escaped. So what it's saying is the former famine that Israel had known in all their struggles. And if you look up here, remember, Isaiah is talking to a group of people that are going into siege and captivity. And so they're starving uh, during this siege and captivity in 586. And then he says, but here in the kingdom, chapter 4, verse 2, there'll be this abundance. Back to your slides, this one most people find very fascinating. Look at Isaiah 65 and turn there in your Bible. I'll just read it to you. It says in verse 20, no more shall an infant from there live but a few days. So there's no infant mortality, nor an old man uh, who has not fulfilled his days. For a child shall die 100 years old. Look up for a second. Do you know what that means? There's going to be a supernatural prolonging of people's lives. Most people will live the entire thousand years. If they don't rebel, they'll live the whole time. Because the curse from the Garden of Eden has been rolled back, not removed. There's still sin inside their hearts if they aren't born again. Even if we are born again, we still struggle and resist against sin today. Like I tell people I'm the worst sinner I know because I don't know you, but I do know how much I know from the Word of God, and I know how much I struggle to obey, and that's what the millennium will be. Save people that are struggling against sin, but they're going to have children who don't embrace Christ. Back to your slides, the supernatural lifespan, and then Isaiah 35 also says, no diseases, no impairments in the coming kingdom. Next slide is just a summary of everything we've seen. There'll be topographical changes, curse lifted. Uh, the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord. Yet we're not in heaven. There's still death, sin. People have their own land. They're having children. They're being fruitful. Next slide. Jerusalem becomes the center of the world. That's what Isaiah 4 says. All the world streams through Jerusalem. And now look at this, number 11. Sacrifices are offered again. Look up for a second because most people need to think about that. Um, let me just illustrate it simply this way. Here's the cross, and here's the Old Testament period, and here's where sacrifices were, and here we are in the New Testament, and we have what's called the Lord's table or supper. Now let me ask you, was anyone saved through offering a, a lamb in the Old Testament? No. No, they weren't saved by offering a lamb. They were saved by faith, the reason they offered the lamb. They needed a substitute because they were sinners. So no one was saved by a sacrifice in the Old Testament. In fact, many people, Isaiah says, were offering sacrifices that God says they're abominable to me. Stop offering them. I'm not listening to you. You, your heart isn't with it. People were saved by faith, bringing a sacrifice that pointed toward the future death of Christ in their place. The New Testament believers in the church are saved by looking back and believing that Jesus died in our place. And the Lord's table reminds us of Jesus' body that was crucified, his blood that was shed. But what's going on in the millennium? What's going on in this temple 
Why are they now offering sacrifices? Because the Old Testament sacrifices are the most beautiful picture of Jesus Christ coming as the perfect spotless lamb, as the substitute, as the sin bearer. And so what goes on in this temple is they go back to offering sacrifices that never saved anyone and don't save anybody then. But those sacrifices, look, here in the millennium, in the millennium, those sacrifices point to Christ's death on the cross. So no one is saved by sacrifices, never were, never will be. Back to your sides, but they will be offered again in the uh, millennial temple. Now we go to Isaiah 59, and if you open your Bibles with me and, and look up, starting in verse 18, Isaiah 59 and verse 18 through 20. And let me get there. 59, 18. According to their deeds, according to, uh, accordingly he will repay fury to his adversaries, recompense to his enemies. The coastlands will fully repay. So shall they fear the name of the Lord. And now look at verse 20. The Redeemer will come to Zion. Now this is, again, Isaiah's lobbying a future view of the second coming of Christ. It's amplified, look on your slides, by Zechariah. And what Zechariah 12 says is that the Lord will return. When does he return? 12.2, when all the nations are surrounding Jerusalem, and Jerusalem is the center focus. And look what happens. The Lord, as he returns, pours out on the house of David, on the Jews, the spirit of grace and supplication, they look on him who they pierced. Now look at it, Zechariah 13. They're all there in Jerusalem, and look what it says in verse 8. And it shall come to pass in all the land that two-thirds shall be cut off. Two-thirds of Israel perishes during the horrors of the tribulation. But I will bring one-third through. And so that's called the remnant in theology and Bible study. And so we're in the day of the Lord. That's that climactic ending, the second coming through heaven. I will gather all the nations in verse 2. They're surrounding Jerusalem. And as the nations are closing in to destroy those last remnant, the second coming takes place. And that's Jesus coming to the Mount of Olives. And look who comes with him in verses 5 and 6. All the saints, all the saints, all the Old Testament saints, all the New Testament saints, all the church, all those who have died during the, the tribulation um, as martyrs, all the saints come with him. And look at this, what's going on on earth? In that day, uh, living waters will flow through Jerusalem and the Lord will be king over all the earth. And then look at this, this is just fascinating. And it shall be, this is the plague in verse 12, which the Lord strikes the people who fight against Jerusalem. It's hard to even read this. Total annihilation. Their flesh will dissolve while they stand on their feet. Their eyes will dissolve in their sockets. Their tongues will dissolve in their mouths. And then the Lord takes over. And look at this. And it shall come to pass, verse 16, everyone who is left of the nations which came against Jerusalem shall go up from year to year to worship the king and to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. The Old Testament feasts come back into the picture. And it shall be whichever family of the earth, verse 17, that does not come to Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, on them there will be no rain. Wow. Next slide. Isaiah 60 describes the coming kingdom age. Isaiah 61 describes the two advents of Christ. It's significant because look at this. It says, this is Isaiah 61 out of my Bible. Does this sound familiar? The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has anointed me to preach glad tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captive, to opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And look, Right here, Jesus stopped in Luke 4.18. 
Look up for a second. What's going on? Jesus goes to his home synagogue, his hometown, Nazareth, where he grew up. And, and they hand him the scroll, and he opens the scroll of Isaiah to right there, what we just read, Isaiah 61. And he reads and stops right in the middle of the sentence. He puts a comma in, and it says he, he closes the scroll and stops. This is the difference between the first advent of Christ here, when Jesus came to suffer on the cross, and the second advent of Christ, which is a part of the day of the Lord. He clearly distinguishes that right there. Look back at your slide, because this is the second coming of Christ, the day of vengeance, to comfort those who mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes. That is Isaiah 61. The next slide, Isaiah 63 graphically uh, describes what's going to happen. And it's in, just like Zechariah, some very graphic terms. And so turn in your Bible to Isaiah chapter 63, and let me read that with you. Isaiah 63, the day of vengeance. And this is what the Lord says. Who is this who comes from Edom? with dyed garments of Basra, the one who is glorious in his apparel, traveling uh, in the greatness of his strength, I will speak in righteousness. Look at verse 2. Why is your apparel red? Now let me read to you what it says in Revelation 19. Do you remember? I mean, I've said this so many times, but Isaiah, let me get to 19. I've got only enough fingers to hold these pages, 19, there we go. Isaiah, I mean, he's talking about the near destruction. He's talking about the coming Lamb of God. He's talking now, boom, about the second coming. Revelation 19, right there. What does it say in verse 11? And I saw heaven opened. Behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him was called Faithful and True and Righteousness. His eyes were like a flame of fire. Uh, he was clothed, verse 13, in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God, and the armies followed him. But look at verse 15. Out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of God. Why? are Jesus' garments red? Well, in Isaiah 63, 1, it talks about Edom and Basra, anger, verse 3, fury, blood. This speaks of the wrath of Christ trampling out, as the hymn goes, the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. He is actually judging the nations that are coming against Jerusalem. It's a day of vengeance. Back in your slides, Isaiah 63. In Isaiah 64, we have one of the most beautiful prayers. Uh, the prophet himself prays this prayer of deliverance. It's beautiful. But chapter 65, if you'll turn there in your Bible, we're looking at the new heavens and the new earth. And it says in Isaiah 65, 17, new heavens and new earth. This is exactly what the Apostle John talks about in Revelation 21. And then right here on your slide, it's the same terminology that Peter talks about in 2 Peter chapter 3. Real quickly, Isaiah 66 talks about uh, Jerusalem in the kingdom age, and Jerusalem in the kingdom age, uh, it's this period of time right here, this thousand-year reign of Christ, and Isaiah describes that. Revelation 20 picks up, and it says that Satan is restrained, and a chain is put on him. If you want to look up for a second, what happens to Satan is Satan is up here, you know, fighting against God in the, you know, in the whole Armageddon thing. He's there, and the Lord sends an angel and has him put into this abyss, and he is bound for a thousand years. Back in your slides... Um, then the millennium takes place, Christ rules, that's Revelation 20. And then what we see in verses 7 through 10 is that Satan is released and something happens. And for just a second, 
uh, go to Revelation 20 with me and let me illustrate it up here because uh, this is kind of the, the lesson that I want to give you. I mean, most of this has been fascinating, but it doesn't have a lot to do with most of you that are listening to this. Uh, most of us are going to be experiencing this event that's right here. It's the end of the church age is the rapture of the church. So almost everything we're studying right now is not going to be experienced by us on earth. We're not going to be here. We're going to be up there watching this. We will come back with Christ at the second coming. All the saints return with Christ. But you say, so why are we spending so much time studying this if we're just going to be up in heaven enjoying it and not spectators? Because there's a lesson, and I want you to see it in chapter 20, starting in verse 7. It says, now when the thousand years have expired. So the day of the Lord starts, tribulation, second coming, millennium starts, the thousand year reign of Christ goes through chapter 20 verses 1 through 6. But look at this. At the end of the thousand years, Satan will be released from prison and he goes out to deceive all the nations in the four corners of the earth. Verse 8. Gog and Magog. Gog is a title of like head, the ruler. So, so he goes out and gets a bunch of uh, rebels to help him organize the world. And they look what they do. They, they, whose number, verse 8, is like the sand of the sea. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints. Whoa, What's, what is the camp of the saints? It's right, right here. Where's my blue? I made it blue so it would stand out. Do you see this? All the way around the temple where Jesus is reigning, the saints, see the camp of the saints, they can't get enough of the Lord. They want to be as close to him as possible. And so they start migrating. People, as the world seemingly is not interested in God, the longer the millennium goes on, the more unbelievers there are. The more their children don't like going through the temple. They don't like watching those old messy sacrifices. Why? Because the heart of humans is desperately wicked. And apart from saving grace, even with Jesus Christ himself sitting on earth, giving all the length and life and prosperity and no, uh, you know, infant mortality, no disfigurement of human bodies, no birth defects. It's just like this perfect environment. They still don't want him. So what happens in chapter 20? It says, all the people from the earth come like the sand of the sea, and they surround the, the millennial temple, the seat of Christ. And this is the shortest battle in history. Uh, they surround the camp of the saints and the beloved city, and fire comes down from God out of heaven and devours them. Like that. Wow. Look back on your slides. Satan is released. He's then put, in verse 10, into the lake of fire. And heaven becomes our home, and we're reminded that life here on earth is like camping. That's what Peter picks up in 2 Peter 1. Well, that's when Jesus returns to earth. He restores and rules. Just before we go, I'd like to read you 2 Peter chapter 1. This is Peter's um, testimony, and I hope that as we study, I mean, Jesus coming to earth and restore and rule, we're still the church on earth. And you know what we're supposed to be doing? This is what Peter says. 2 Peter 1, verse 13. Yes, I think it's right, as long as I'm in this tent, to stir you up and remind you, knowing that shortly I must put off my tent, just as our Lord Jesus showed me. Moreover, I'll be careful to ensure that you always have a reminder of these things. What did, what did Peter want us to know? Well, he said, the purpose of Revelation is so that you know all this is going to happen. So that you know that believers are in heaven. 
so that you know that God has a plan to restrain Satan, so that you know that Christ wants you to be focusing on what we're supposed to do on earth. What are we supposed to do? Please God with our life and do everything possible to make disciples of Jesus Christ. Heaven is our home. Earth is just camping. See what Peter said? To remind you, as long as I'm in this tent, what's a tent? It's a temporary dwelling. It's a portable dwelling. It is something that is used for a little while, and then without any sadness, you just say, wow, that was great camping. Put it in the garage. That's what this body is like. This is our tent. We're here on earth. This world is not our home. We're on our way through. We're pilgrims. We're strangers. We, like the millennial saints, want to get as close to God as possible. But we are in the church, and we're supposed to be going into all the world and sharing the gospel. Let me ask you, is that what you're living for? Does the book of Revelation keep in focus that we're only here for a while, our master's coming to get us, soon we're going to be around the throne, and he's going to pour out his wrath, and he left us here to fulfill his purpose. I hope that the book of Isaiah, explaining the book of Revelation, will remind you, heaven is home. Earth is camping. I'm left here to do what Christ left me to do. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Father, thank you for giving us the book of Isaiah. Thank you that you are coming as king. You're going to restore this earth and make it perfect. You're going to rule. But right now, we're supposed to be doing what you left us to do. I pray that we would spend time prayerfully surrendering today and saying, Lord, get me back on track for what you left me to do. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.